Well, thank you so much for joining me today. The white paper has finally arrived after some time waiting. The emphasis is really on speeding up housing delivery, so getting homes built. Um, the government is encouraging small and medium-sized builders to you know, foster greater competition in the market. Is this going to make any difference to housing completions long term? Sam, I'm going to ask you. Um, well, it should do. Um, I think the, um, the white paper refers to output from SMEs being 44,000, I think, in 2007, down to 18,000 2015. Um, so in the context of trying to take completions up and beyond 200,000, that 40, 50,000 contribution from SMEs is, is potentially quite significant. Um, the references in the white paper seem to solely be around, well, there's the funding provision um, and support there, um, and then there's reference in land supply to smaller sites and windfall sites. Um, we we'll perhaps go into that in a little bit more detail, but I, I thought it interesting that only a few weeks before the white paper was published, the HBF had produced a very detailed report on um, supporting SMEs and there was obviously some timing issues associated with that, but there was a lot of good detail in there, and I'd hope that some of that, that detail around, around funding particularly and, and, and some planning issues manifests itself a little bit further on in the, in the detail that follows the white paper. Yeah, I, I actually totally agree with that. I think it was very positive to see in the white paper um, the encouragement for local authorities to identify small sites to help the SME builders. Um, I also think it's very positive because delivery on small sites can often and is often much quicker than it is on, on a big development. And if we're looking in terms of having a quick delivery um, for an urgent need, I think that's a really positive step forward. The, the, the there should be a, a, a there should be a huge market there because um, I mean we at, we at Barrett's typically would not look at sites that are less than around 100 units um, because of our getting on site costs and getting off site uh, getting off site costs um, we would want to be delivering on a site for about three years so 36 private completions a, a year average takes you to around three years and over 100 now conceivably then and and we're not um, uh, unlike the other uh, major volume PLC build builders, conceivably then there should be a space for people to be bringing forward sites of, of up to 150, 40 that gives a supply of small, build, uh, uh, small builders that pipeline that they can go to and forward fund. Um, I, I, I do think though that something needs to be done around the, the fact that the cost of applying for planning permission for about 50 can be about the same as applying for 500 and often can be equally contentious when you get into issues around say local open space and there isn't an up-to-date open space study or loss of employment land and there isn't an up-to-date employment land study and that those issues can be really um, disincentivizing to owners and, and small builders to, to try to take those sites through the through the planning system. Okay so definitely some room in the market there but still some barriers perhaps um, around planning fees in particular you think. Well another element of the proposals was looking at shorter planning permissions again just with this uh, continued focus on speeding up construction, speeding up completions. Jamie what, what did you think of this measure? Um, I think it's the manifestation of all the rhetoric that we had in the build-up, which was very anti-land banking and making sure that developers deliver faster and don't sit on land um, to drive prices up. And that, I think, I think given the, as I say, the rhetoric that, that trailed the housing white paper, something had to be in there along those lines. I think the reality of the paragraph um, is a lot more diluted. Um, there's a, it's very subtle language. I think it talks about encouraging local planning authorities to um, shorten timeframes. And it has the massive caveat attached, which is except in circumstances where it could hinder deliverability or viability, which is pretty much every single time. Um, so I don't think in reality it's going to make a massive difference. I think it's um, a nod towards the rhetoric, as I say, um, something had to be in there that was going to be firm. And it's seen, I think, as being one of the sticks. There are other sticks in there. Um, but I don't think it's a particularly strong stick. Okay. Well, we, we had Philip Barnes, of course, from Barrett's, one of your colleagues, coming on and debunking the, the land banking myths. Um, is this provision going to make any difference at all, do you think, Sam? I, yeah, I'm minded to agree with, with, with Jamie on its practical effect. I mean, I'd be interested to 
to know what impact move, the move from five years to three years had um, a little while ago. Perhaps, perhaps some, perhaps none. It sounds good. Um, I, I mean, I, Phil, I think made the point um, that there isn't uh, there isn't a site within our control that has planning permission that we're not trying to get on site. So that the, 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 the two year provision wouldn't necessarily hinder um, our business. Um, I think it's interesting that there's no there's no mention of the type of planning permissions that are being granted, and and that is a that's a major factor I think in in delivery the breakdown of the two hundred thousand odd into outlines and fulls, um, and and that and some of the messages around delivery and who is being granted planning permission perhaps speaks to the the difference between a planning permission that. Uh, a builder might get to get on site and the permission that a promoter might get to then um, sell to a builder. But in terms of the practical influence on, on our business, I can't, really, I can't really see any. And it's worth remembering actually that ability is already there. So if local authorities did want to shorten the timeframes or indeed extend them, they can do that um, as it currently stands. Um, I think with the housing delivery test being what it seems to be, um, I'm not entirely convinced local authorities where there is that deliverability question would be keen to see that shortened um, when it throws that into doubt, particularly if they are, if their stick is the housing delivery test um, and that's how they're being judged, why on earth would they do anything to compromise um, deliverability? Um, in that way. I also think that if there is a delay in build out, then there are other reasons for it. There are contextual reasons which shortening a, a, a time scale for a spade to go in the ground is not going to solve. And actually, the focus must be on how do we speed up completions as opposed to start when we start, because that doesn't necessarily impact on when a whole, a particular huge development would be completed, yeah. if there are other factors. I, I, I think it's the stock of planning permissions at any given time that the industry can, can draw on and build the future planning of their business around that's the most important thing for me. I mean, often, if, uh, if, if, a, if a planning permission, if a deal's being secured on a subject to planning basis, then the fun only really begins once planning permission has been granted, because then there is the negotiation with the owner about what the price for that for that land is and that can be a very complex process in itself and and the two years might sharpen minds um, but you make a practical somebody makes a practical start and the planning permissions the planning permissions there so practically speaking again we come back to that point I'm not sure what what difference it makes. So, so quite a blunt and, and as you say, heavily caveated in any case, uh, tool for quite a, a nuanced uh, issue really, which needs a bit more analysis. I'd completely forgotten about the five to three year um, shift and like, did that make any difference? That's an interesting area, I think, for, for research. Um, um, so one of the things that got a lot of noise in the lead up to, to the white paper, a lot of speculation about what would happen here is, of course, Greenbelt, um, never far away from planning discussions. Um, the white paper essentially reinforces the position of Greenbelt development only in exceptional circumstances. It does offer some greater clarity on the criteria of what those exceptional circumstances are potentially, um, but still only in exceptional circumstances. Is that right? Does that go far enough, Hannah? Well, the issue of Greenbelt is politically toxic, whichever party you belong to and whichever way that you believe politics should go. Um, but I think professionals, in uh, planning professionals, we, we need to sit down and agree a position. Are we going to be looking at regularly reviewing our green belt? Um, as other countries do who have urban containment policies, they regularly review the boundaries. Or are we going to be pushing for more resources for local authorities, um, for example, so that they can push forward more brownfield site, more densification, we need to decide as a profession or as pro professionals within a profession which direction we want to focus our energies. I think that's where we need to move to now. And what was in the Green Paper was not surprising. Sam. <laughs> How long have we got? Um, yeah, I, I, I think the within the realms of the probable, I think that the clarification around exceptional circumstances, which in effect I think um, introduces a sequential test in effect, um, is potentially quite helpful to those local planning authorities that do want to release Greenbelt and take their members on the journey towards um, doing so. And for those that don't, there is a, a stick there that 
the development industry might be willing to yield at examinations. Um, so in planning terms, um, it, it's potentially quite helpful. But you cannot, um, as Hannah said, you cannot disentangle the planning of Greenbelt with the politics of Greenbelt. And my concern um, would be um, that unless it's tackled with, it has the potential to become um, a behemoth looming over public life in the same way that the NHS does, in that it means, it means something in the public's mind that it might actually not be. Um, and in that sense, I think I, I, I was encouraged by the rhetoric that in the white paper around housing targets, which ultimately is the driver for, 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 for Greenbelt release, that and 1974 administrative boundaries. Um, but the, the, there is reference to, to the ducking of housing targets. And I think that use of that word ducking, I thought quite interesting because it actually speaks to the intransigence of some authorities. Now, if we could be a little bit bolder in our language around Greenbelt, to try to deal with some of these myths and perceptions about what it is and what it should be, and um, um, then I think that would be. I, I would. I would like to see that from some of our political um, political leaders. And I think actually there is an opportunity to do so. Ipsos Mori did a poll for the CPRE a couple of years ago, and 25% of people hadn't actually heard about heard of the green belt itself, and that figure rose to 64% amongst the 19 to 24 year olds. Now, they're the people who I think we should be having some conversations with about what the planning system looks like in a few years' time and the importance of either sticking with green belt boundaries that in Greater Manchester, for example, haven't been touched since 1984, are actually meeting housing needs. Um, because if the debate continues to be led by pictures of gently rolling pastoral landscapes whenever a green belt is mentioned, then the chances of that fundamental reform based upon a shift in public opinion becomes ever more unlikely. So time to get read about the green belt, Jamie? Yeah, I mean, I think it depends on how you look at it. It's very clever wording in the housing white paper because it's worded negatively um, to suggest that only in these situations, the exceptional circumstances being defined, should those boundaries be re-examined. But I think by putting it in a document, um, it's open for consultation as it stands, but putting it out there and clarifying it, gives an opportunity for those local authorities that want to have a sensible conversation on Greenbelt to actually do it. Um, that opportunity wasn't there, it certainly wasn't as um, available to them until the circumstances were specified. Um, there'll be all sorts of debate, I'm sure, with very clever people talking about what um, you know, maximising or optimising density is going to be, and whether you have followed the correct tests and whether you've explored all those other reasonable options. There'll be all sorts of arguments about that. But I think at the very least, it's that nudge factor. It's the ability for those local authorities, as I say, that want to have that conversation to actually go and do so. OK, so more conversation on Greenbelt, perhaps next time? <laughs> and the time after that. Yeah. <laughs> Thank you so much. Thank you.